So, uh, my name is Edmund Noble, and I'll be talking about Finally Tagless, which is a tactic for designing performant pure FP applications in Scala. Pure FP applications. You actually cannot mix this with side effects, so keep that in mind. Um, to help with comparison, I've got a few examples I'm going to return to during the talk. Uh, at the start, they're just going to be plain old object oriented. Sorry. To start, uh, they'll just be plain object-oriented Scala with mutable state and side effects and all that beautiful stuff you love. Um, and later I'm going to transform them more and more until you don't recognize them at all. Uh, until all of a sudden it's the same but slightly different. I'm sorry, that's completely vague, but you'll see what I mean. So here we have uh, a storage interface, a service, if you will, which is provided um, by this map storage concrete implementation. Uh, notice that uh, this map storage uses this state, internal state var current map, which is completely inseparable from the logic inside of map storage, right? So the fact that it gets on this current map and the fact that it contains state, which is a map, are completely tied together. You can't escape that, all right? Secondly, uh, because of what storage is, you can see that if you implement storage, you have to use side effects because all the methods return unit, option string. There's no way they can just pull values out of thin air, so you have to use some kind of side effect. Because of that, the effects are not explicit in the types. So the types hide the effects, and the effects get hidden from you, and you just forget about them, hopefully. And that's the idea of, I guess, object-oriented programming, is that you can hide effects. FP is more about showing effects. So. Number two, I have this um, very mutable, I don't have an implementation, sorry, it would have been very large. Um, it's an SVG renderer, essentially. So if you, it's some kind of, there's some kind of state inside of it, and every time you ask for it to draw a shape, it will write out to a file, oh, I don't know, uh, Android dot, I don't know, draw path, draw circle, whatever, and it'll compile it to another language, right? So this is, in essence, a compiler, with mutable state because everything returns unit, okay? So notice that there is some kind of internal language to the SVGs, which is paths, right? So SVGs have shapes and one shape is a path and paths also have their separate implementation of, of an interpreter or compiler, which is path renderer, right? And SVG renderer is responsible for given a path renderer, including it into the file that is compiling or uh, creating a new path compiler if it needs to, right? So what I'm going to be talking about essentially for this entire talk is dependency injection, right? Dependency injection is allowing objects to provide services to other objects. So objects provide services and require services from other objects. And in that sense, objects are a sort of action on the objects they require that's polymorphic over their implementations, right? So polymorphism is a completely different way to hide effects that doesn't hide them everywhere, but only hides them locally, okay? So uh, the fact that DI does this is, is essentially means that DI is the recognition that for proper decoupling, services can only be implemented in terms of other services. So it's nicely recursive. You'll notice that that's very similar to Marcus's talk with the uh, objects. So DI, in theory, allows you to maintain services and their implementation separately, but we have the expression problem, right? So there's no way to add functionality to a service without breaking every single object which implements the service. So you have to evolve together these services and the objects. Um, this, this notion is, uh, is not escapable at all, it's, it's kind of inherent into what a service and object is. Um, so in, in Scala for DI, we have uh, compile time annotation frameworks, we got runtime annotation frameworks, you got some plain old constructor, in, constructor injection, which is what I used earlier, and uh, you have the cake pattern, sorry guys, um, and uh, you have free structures and finally tagless structures, which are both dual implementations of the same concept. Each has different notions of what an operation is, right? So services provide operations, little units of functionality. And the way that they're bundled into a service depends on what kind of DI method you're using. So we'll start with uh, the initially tagless method, okay? Now, initially tagless because what you do normally with the free monad is still tagless, okay? So the 
the essence of this technique is to define services as data types, algebra types, similarly to the recursive uh, recursion schemes talk earlier, except uh, these algebras represent calls to functions on objects that have not yet been made. Okay, so programs are then tree values that are built up from the data and some kind of free structure that lets you compose all of these calls. Okay, then um, the free structure describes the branching properties of the tree. So it describes how the tree's nodes, the internal nodes, appear or are structured, and the algebras decide the leaves, the data there. So Coproducts are a method in the initial tagless approach of composing services. So if you want to depend on one service, you have to use free of that algebra over A. If you want to depend on two, free of coproduct one algebra, the alge other algebra over A. Notice I'm providing two coproduct implementations because this technique is not at all specific to using uh, type constructors. Your algebra doesn't have to be a type constructor at all. In, in fact, in the case of, let me, I can skip ahead a little bit. Oh, yeah, here we go. There we go. You can see that this storage action right here uh, is, a, is a type, has a type constructor, is a type constructor, sorry. But here, this A has no type constructor at all, right? So, oh damn, I skipped way too far ahead. Oof. Um, okay, all right. So products, products allow you to compose services. So if you have two, uh, sorry, not, not serv services, objects, same deal, essentially. Um, you can compose them in the sense that you can run a program that depends on a service on several services simultaneously by running on the product of those services. So products, tuples, uh, coproducts, either or the higher kinded either if you prefer. So the free monad approach brings a few concrete benefits in terms of how we can view DI because there's three players that there's three players and we think there's two. There's objects, services, and programs. Functions that use services, or essentially single method objects. Very similarly to, again, Marcus's talk. <laughs> um, so, object-oriented DI frameworks cannot take this into account because side effects and values don't really match, right? So, in the OO sphere, right, if you want to put any code if you want to make any code depend on a service, you need to put it inside some area of your code where the services have already been injected. Instead, you, just you can define standalone programs with the free approach and decrease the coupling. So, uh, program augmentation is a very powerful concept of free, which allows you essentially to perform aspect-oriented programming on your free structure. So every point in your, every algebra is essentially a place where you can inject advice from your interpreter or, uh, yes, from your interpreter, um, so you can change the program after the fact, after it's been constructed, right? So let's talk about free structures. We've got monads, applicatives, functors, monoids, but every type class has a free structure. All of them. Uh, I know that because you can define one for any type class. It's not efficient, but it works. Um, so monads allow programs to be run on the outputs of other programs, right? So your call tree can actually change shape depending on the values that move through it. Your applicatives um, require a fixed call tree shape, but allow you to compose these call trees in parallel. So you can be like, I'll call this program, and I'll call this program, and I will use their results to do something else, and that something else is provided by the fact that applicatives are also functors, and functors allow you to modify the result of a program with pure functions, exclusively, that's the point. So free monoids on the down one kind level allow you to build programs from other programs sequentially, but without them depending on each other's outputted values, right? So programs, instead of outputting values, programs are values, they don't yield any values, and they just execute one after another, right? So, what are they really? Free is a way to defer type class resolution for a type until you map that type over to another type for which the type class instance does exist. So, for example, free structures, you give a natural transformation over to a type constructor which has a monad instance. Free monoids, you have uh, lists fold or foldables fold, which given a monoid instance, 
uh, sorry, fold map, which given a monoid instance and a function over to that monoid, monoidal type will fold the entire list into a single value. So, uh, despite the fact that, the, that free structures don't exactly look the same just because we're type constructors, ordinary types, the idea is the same. This is what that idea is. Uh, so free zero, or you know, ordinary free for the, for monoids, for example, semigroups, type classes which are just semigroup of A, monoid of A, not monoid of F of, uh, monad of F of underscore, et cetera, right? So you have the fact that if F is a free uh, T over A, then you have a T of F right there, and you have the ability to convert, you know, to feed in the type class instance that you're basically faking, right? And then free one is, is the exact same thing, but with a few arrows replaced with natural transformations, right? So, here's an example. Uh, storage, oh no, right. Uh, so storage, uh, that storage earlier, right? That key value storage for strings, uh, for keys and strings as data. This is an implementation of what that service would look like as an initial algebra up there. Um, and that is, um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Just take the methods, make them into case classes, and uh, make them extend storage action, right? And then we can see that storage action is a kind of stand-in for a monadic f of a, which we don't know yet, but which we'll interpret it to later, okay? So the fact that these path algebras are composed with a monoid, however, uh, oh, sorry, oof, sorry, I'm wrong, wrong slide. <laughs> um, so the fact that these, um, the, here's the interpreter, sorry. This interpreter in terms of fold map, pattern matching on the algebra, and creating a natural transformation. Um, Notice that this, this map, this state where you can uh, access a, ma a, a map with keys and values, which are strings, is encapsulated by the state monad, right? So that's a type constructor we can fill in for storage action with a real monad instance, and then fold map takes care of the rest, okay? So next we have, uh, oof. sorry, I moved some slides around before I did this just to change the colors of the uh, code, and it, it, it mixed things up a little bit. Oof. Wow, I, well, I deleted it. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Can you see that? No, you can't. Jeez. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so you can see a definition of that SVG renderer uh, in terms of a service, in terms of an algebra, um, right here. And then draw circle, draw ellipse. Sorry? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, th that readable? Okay, good. Um, so, you can see here that we have uh, circles, ellipse, same as before, but this path inclusion requires that you have a list of these path algebras, okay? This list in here is hard-coded. And what is list? Free monoid, okay? So we're hard-coding monoid into our control structure, right? So this is not good, right? I mean, who wants to hard-code monoid in there when you could, I don't know, potentially want to use semigroup, commutative monoid, whatever. So. Uh, Okay. So, here is a little bit of a program transformation, augmentation, if you will. Given this storage program, this program which acts on this key value storage, I want a new program which acts on that key value storage and emits a vector of all the keys it removed from that key value storage. Say I have some kind of caching algorithm which needs this information. I actually do, by the way. Um, so here you can see some incredible ugliness because storage action is translated into writer T of storage program string question mark. So you see storage program is free of storage action and A, okay? Which means that we are creating if we fold map over this, we create yet another free structure inside the writer T. And uh, 
and we also reallocate the algebra, right? So, actually, I don't think I need to do that. Yeah, I can, I can avoid that here. But if I wanted to alter the algebra in any way, that would require reallocating it. So, uh, the reason I have to use storage program here is because writer t needs an applicative instance, right? And I can't provide that for storage action. It's just an algebra, okay? So I need to use freeze applicative instance instead. So uh, it's very annoying and very ugly, and it's not something anyone would want to do. So, getting back from free for a second, using a free structure and algebra for dependency injection means that you need boilerplate that injects the algebra values into the free structure. I know freestyle solves this and other macro-based solutions solve this, but it's more code. So it also means allocating algebra values, allocating free values to hold the algebras, and then allocating and traversing the structures, these call structures for every call to a method, okay? Now, perhaps this is some incredibly domain-specific, high-level part of your code, but if it's not, if this is the heart of your code, you probably want this not to allocate so much. You don't want this GC pressure. No one needs that. So, after that, pattern matching on algebras is really slow. It's slow because it's linear in the number of cases, right? So if you have a huge algebra, you, you're gonna take a huge amount of time to match it. As well, uh, because it, it goes through the choices one at a time. As well, you're going to, if you, if you take products of interpreters, they all have to redo the pattern matching work. Each of them has to do it themselves, which is wasteful, right? So. Um, why, you might ask, do we need to allocate a tree data structure if we already have this structure for describing call trees? The call stack. So, instead of building up this tree, transforming the tree, and then folding it down into a single value, we can just manipulate these values directly on the interpreter side. And what I mean by this is finally tagless. So, Going over uh, the first part, I have to, there's a, a couple caveats, caveats I have to mention, because there are a lot of misconceptions online about tagless final. Tagless means there's no type information, no runtime type information the interpreter has to worry about, okay? So the interpreter is not a type checker, okay? That's essentially all that means. So that's also the case with the initial approach, is that you use Scala's type system to ensure that your programs are constructed correctly. So final, Final just means the opposite of initial in category theory. In this case, it's really just a way to distinguish it from the initial encoding. And now, why is the initial encoding called the initial encoding? Because the opposite of final. It's, uh, it's just Oleg's, he just came up with it. Um, <laughs> so uh, just because it, it, might be, it might include a type checker, the interpreter, um, doesn't mean it wouldn't necessarily use runtime reflection, because you can also write your own type checkers, as was just demonstrated. But, Moving on to what final tagless actually is. Oh man, did my laptop just freeze? Ah, oh, there we go. So services are just traits, just like they were in the object-oriented approach, but they have abstract types. Or, and the abstract types might be um, type constructors. They might just be ordinary types, A, F of underscore. Um, but the objects are just concrete, the objects are concrete implementations of that trait, so classes. Right? So programs, all they are is methods which are polymorphic over those type, those abstract types that call into the objects they're passed and can destruct the call tree of that computation directly. There's no intermediates required, okay? So passing objects around is, well, or, you know, the dependency injection part of dependency injection, the wiring, is not a solved problem at all. In Haskell, people use type classes all the time for this kind of thing. Personally, I don't like to tie business logic to types, but if you use phantom types with it and implicits, that should probably work fine. So, um, personally, I like to distribute objects with implicits and scope them inside these top level objects. So it's like every kind of, every part of my application has a main where I make some domain specific decision about the interpreters I'm gonna be using. So one thing we lose with this approach is that with final algebras, the clear separation between the nodes, the internal nodes, and the leaves is much less obvious because nodes in the tree are actually just functions that call other functions, right? So every function which emits one of these abstract types 
creates a new internal node in, sorry, not emits, takes in uh, any of these abstract types, creates a new internal node in the tree because that is putting these nodes under the current node, right? So uh, we, need to be sh we need to know where these are because in Scala we have a limited stack, right? Or at least on the JVM, or at least right now. Um, so if we start blowing our, not growing our call trees willy-nilly, we'll blow the stack. So for an example of what this looks like, storage, or KV storage right now, um, we've got a very, very similar example to not only the first example, but also the second example. Replace storage algebra with F, and uh, that's it, really. And uh, don't, and here's the thing, map storage final just uses the state monad, exactly like that other interpreter did. And uh, sorry, this map storage final is a concrete object which implements this service, okay? So it's got, Notice also it's got less boilerplate. It's also got better type inference. I don't have to provide a single type parameter. Um, and as well, I don't even need to mention monad anywhere, right? There's no coupling of monad to this, right? There's no storage program type, which is free, of, free monad of storage algebra and A, right? So monads are completely removed. So you could use applicatives, you could use functors, you can use whatever you want. Um, this SVG renderer, just another example, is we have an abstract type we keep as a type member because that's the internal, uh, that's the internal state, essentially, of a sub-object of our object, right? And then those, and all they do is just work with type parameters. There's no magic here, and there's, it doesn't seem like you'd need to use side effects if you choose an A, which doesn't require that you use them. Notice also that uh, draw path does not require a list of path algebras. That dependency on monoid is removed completely. It's only existent at the use site, right? So any program that uses this has to demand, hey, I need a path final of A, and A has to be a monoid, okay? So program transformations get turned on their head because instead of pro programs don't exist as data anymore, right? All they are is call trees. So instead of introspecting the data, recreating some new data, we transform the interpreter such that it acts on the data differently. So that we, we can make a new interpreter which acts on another interpreter. And I know it sounds a little bit abstract until you get to a concrete example like this. So let's say you want to remove, uh, again, you, let's say you want to log the keys that you've removed from this storage, right? So here, given this storage, uh, the storage interpreter, and the fact that it's an applicative, okay? Now, we don't need to allocate some new structure. We already know it's an applicative. We don't need to waste any time. And then we can just say, okay, uh, if we're getting or putting, it's the same as usual, but if we're removing, we are also adding on this little key vector, which is gonna get, you know, added up, because it's the writer monad, right? So, here is a little sample program just to whet your appetite. Notice I don't need any boilerplate or anything to get this up and running. Okay, so put if absent is a standard method on, the, on maps, mutable maps, I think, though. And it just, if, it's, if the data is present at that key, it doesn't do anything. Otherwise, it puts data at that key. So stack safety. Stack safety is very important for uh, for Scala. It's kind of one of the bigger sticking points for moving to FP, just because recursion is so huge. So finally, tagless stack safety is basically just ordinary FP stack safety. So you can't rely on free to completely fix your stack safety issue, because all you're doing is calling functions, and your functions, if they're not if they're recursive, you're going to blow the stack, or you might. So you still have to use tail rec, monads tail rec m in cats for stack safe recursion. And for everything else, which isn't tail recursive, because not everything is tail recursive, you need to bring free back. So bring free back into the interpreter, okay, so that if you bring, if you put the free structure in the concrete choice of type in your objects, then you have not only do you not have pattern matching, you don't have to allocate algebras, but you're stack safe. And the client code is not aware of which free structure you're using. And if you don't need that uh, stack safety and you know it's, it's always gonna be safe, you can just take it out, right? It's just a single line of code. It's not baked into your application everywhere. 
So monad transformers are great, right? So we were just talking about how you can use them to transform programs, add extra effects to them, but they aren't perfect because number one, they enforce an order of effects. So writer T over reader T and reader T over writer T, not the same thing. One can access the other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, this also prevents interpreters from talking to each other, right? So let's say I have an interpreter which emits some logs, and I have another interpreter which should be able to see those logs. How can I do that if the F type is abstract and I don't know it has writer or reader? So uh, they also can't, they can't transform each other's layers, and extensible effects is exactly the solution for this issue. And extensible effects is also a free monad, just so you know. So it does, it's also stack safe. Um, so type, extensible effects are provided by a, a bunch of libraries, but most notably type level F, which I co-maintain with E. Torbor, um, Eric Torbor. So now you can get this completely magical version of this removed keys log um, storage interpreter augmenter. So that in essence, if there's already a writer effect somewhere inside the effect stack, which is being implemented by this, um, you can just touch that same effect. You don't have to add your own layer. You can touch that same effect and you can, you can similarly interfere with other effects which have been added by other interpreter transformers. So you can, uh, you can also see that the implementation of this is very, I mean, it's basically the same only, the only difference is that instead of using writer t, uh, you have to use writer dot tail there because that automatically f's a free monad, so that's just putting that into a free monad there, writer, and then adding storage actions after it. So this avoids. So since finally tagless is capable of program transformations with f. Instead of transforming programs as data, we can transform interpreters and we avoid all of the performance problems initial has, the initial encoding, with program transformations. Because that's the biggest issue, is that you have more transformations, you get more allocations. So, final remarks. Um, I hope I've uh, imparted a bit of design and performance knowledge, maybe a little bit, and uh, especially just how big the FP design space is, because it's giant. Absolutely. And uh, hopefully, we can all leave the cake pattern behind. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, this one? Yeah, that, uh, oh, the member? Okay, yes. So uh, instead of asking for an F and then putting writer T over it, we're asking for an effect stack FS and we're asking for evidence that it already has writer in it. Okay? So that we can transform that same writer effect instead of adding our own. Any other ones? Yes? Is, uh, does EFS use any runtime cast or is it just totally safe? Is it a special effect? Mm. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, <laughs> it's not completely safe, I'll be honest. And uh, F is not completely safe for performance reasons. Um, namely, that there is a very nice data structure which we use called Catnable, which is really performant, and we stole it from FS2, thanks Daniel and Michael Pilquist who actually did it. Um, and um, it's really nicely performant, but it doesn't, you can't have a vector, or you can't have a Catnable of functions which with types that lead into other functions. Sorry, I'm, I'm going into F's implementation details here, but essentially, no, F is not safe inside and yes, sometimes people get bitten by that. And I hope that our test coverage has improved enough that that won't be the case again. Yes? So the, uh, the cast inside Catnable, like at least in FS2 Catnable, are similar to the cast inside uh, cast itself, where it's, um, it's basically just working around the bug in the compiler to kill writer. Uh, right. Oh. Yeah, 
Yeah. So I, I looked at Alex Konovalov's uh, implementation of, t of type aligned catenable, and that, I saw that issue in his implementation, but the catenable I know from FS2 has an array buffer in it. And I don't know if you're gonna make array buffer type aligned. I don't think that's possible. So. It's safe. It's safe. Trust us, it's safe. We have we have we have more tricks than that in F for performance, but they're I swear they're useful. They're good performance. They're things that will, for example, uh, remove some dynamic dispatch from implicits and make implicit summoning take constant time, for example. So any other ones? Yes. So that's the thing, right? Initial encoding allowing you to describe your call tree as data is really useful for uh, mocks, right? I mean, that's what mocks are, is testing that a call tree has a certain shape. So the initial encoding is incredibly useful for that case. As well, if you have a uh, serialization boundary, for example, or not a serialization boundary, but like an async boundary, like a queue in your program, you can't push, um, well, I guess you could you could push this, these, these values in, but no, it doesn't really make sense. You, you wanna push values of the initial encoding into a queue so that they can be interpreted by someone else, if you're doing that, yeah. Um, but overall, uh, finally tagless versus F, uh, there's not a huge difference. I mean, if you, if you don't need that extra expressivity that is the interpreter's layers talking to each other, you're fine with just finally tagless, and that's just cats. Right, and it's cats, which is less verbose than free. And uh, notice, I, I didn't talk about composing services because it actually isn't even a problem in finally tagless. Because instead of having your program, which is a co which has a co-product of algebras, right? All you do is you have a program which accesses several interpreters. That's it. So just take multiple parameters. That's all. Instead of co-products. So uh, yeah. Anyone? All right. Give Edmund another round of applause.